people said in the different traditions that cultivate reality or stillness, that if you hang around somebody who spends time, most of their time, all of their time in the stillness, that it has a healing quality. And I think between the period that I went out <laughs> and came back, I can perceive the effect of that healing quality uh, on all of you. There's a kind of stillness that arrived that was not here this morning, so enjoy it. Um, I can say myself that it's just, it sounds uh, mystical in the negative sense. It sounds mysterious or woo-woo, but it also makes a certain amount of sense that if you're around a person who's filled with toxic thought syndrome, as most of us are, uh, then it's going to entrain with your toxic thought syndrome. But if you hang out with somebody who's not manifesting that at all, it doesn't really give anything for your toxic shock syndrome, toxic thought syndrome to attach to. And you just feel that little bit of difference, so. Yeah, there's another split <clears throat> that as you get further along, you can see in your perceptions. I mean, you can, it's a bunch of tests, and you can see that, in fact, what you believe to be reality isn't real. I mean, you look at reality, and you can know that it's not real. It's got a different energy to it. It's got a different feel to it. It has, doesn't have sharp edges, just like that. Then it can flip back out into reality, conventional reality. Then it can flip back into that little space again. That can also happen with perception, direct perception. With time, uh, what you're doing is kind of what you're saying. You're shifting in and out of, yes, I see clearly, no, I don't see clearly. Yes, I see clearly, no, I don't see, don't see clearly. But you're in, into where the reality is, in fact, that this isn't real. That's not just a philosophical you know, pr premise. You can actually dr directly see, know, understand at the deepest possible level, this is not a real thing you're looking at. Uh, That's then, really important right yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then you can push back into consensus reality. And you move back and forth through it. It's like, it, like these, you uh, used to have the, the games you can see, like a Necker, Necker cube, or it's this, or it's that, it's up, or it's down. It's, you can see, you just turn it, it's two faces, or it's a, it's a, a, a vase. You can just watch that flip back and forth. But you can flip back into what's the reality or the unreality, and then the consensus reality. It just flops back and forth. Eventually, as you get more and more stable in the unreal space, so you end up living in the unreal space, and everything becomes basically psychedelic, then you see basically all the time pretty much the unreality, the real unreality. And I think what Gary means by the real unreality there is that it comes into being and goes away. It's not, it's not persistent, so it's not real in the sense that it persists. Well, I mean, it, it, it gets more persistent. I mean, the less there is of you, the more there is of that, the more frequently that is there, and eventually you deconstruct the eye more and more and more. There's nothing there to concretize the perceptions into an object, and you don't see them as a fixed reality. I mean, I see all of you as like, you know, impressionist paintings, like the River of the Grand Shot. It's like a pointless painting where, you know, you're not real, don't take it personal. But, but you're not real in a very fundamental sense, even though you appear to be real like a point of his painting, but in reality you're not really real. It turns out to be, I think a bunch of us uh, who are, do what I do or have the thing that I have. And um, there's a, this scale called the Hood Mysticism Scale that goes to 160. And they asked 36 of us you know, how we ranked on the scale. We took a whole bunch of questions and everything. It turns out that nine of the 36 of us were at the 160 level. People taking psychedelics are to like the 152 level. So this is really a psychedelic life. You live in a psychedelic world, basically. You still function. You can pass for being functional. But at the same time, you know, you also know that this is not a reality. But that's because you're living in reality. Yeah. You, you, you are reality. All the of other this. way around, yes. You see yeah. the other way around. There. But your, your percepts can flip back. <laughs> well, you can see now. Yeah. I mean, that, like, because really getting good with the fact that 
what you've been convinced of as reality, like your body, your perceptions, other people, all that has so much persuasive capture on you is actually not real in the sense that you expect it to be real. And by that I mean, when we treat other things as real, we treat them as if they persist in time. And that there's a persistence in time over there on the other end called Tucker. And then as opposed to Tucker is the unfolding of a bunch of energy and patterns and manifestation. There's no persistent entity there called Tucker. That's what makes him so much fun, in fact. That's what makes him so lovable. But when we interact with people, we'll say, oh, well, you know, there's that Josh over there, and Josh is joshing, right? And I'm not joshing about that. Uh, but no, when we treat other people, we were like, well, of course, I'm totally transient. I know that, you know, the way I can be changes, whether it's morning, night, or, you know, if I'm at work or I'm on my bike. But other people, they have an obligation to be other people like that persistently. Why are they not being persistently like that? So. I'm just trying to unpack here, like you can work on this in just quote unquote ordinary reality that really questioning, by questioning, you know, when am I, where am I, who am I, you start to see this pointillist painting that Gary is talking about, that, that everything comes into being as an appearance, but it is not actual, which does not mean you just step in front of the pointillist painting that is a bus because it has certain characteristics of it within the painting. <laughs> but it's not real in the way in which we're going around with our expectation of things being real. And, yeah. It's also important to recognize that the world you see, and you see, and you see, isn't the world I can see. Because your, your perceptors are different than mine. You certainly have better hearing than I do. I mean, you're not, you have better hearing than I do. Your eyesight's different than mine. We don't even, we have a consensus reality on what blue is. I have no clue what you think blue is. I know what this says to me, and most of us would agree this is something like blue because we've kind of agreed to that. But I have no idea what you actually see as a color. So we don't know. Bring a dog into the room, bring a bird into the room, different world for them completely. We see it differently, they see it differently. There is no reality reality beyond what our perception, our perceptors, and our brain create out of it. And there's a huge space to be browsed there in the sense that what you're treating as a static reality when you see this world like this, it, it means that you're framing it in a particular way. But as you let go of thinking you know what the world is, you don't fill in so much. You just see the rhododendron, or you see the bird, or you feel the breath, and you're not living inside so much of a story. That's why I, you know, that's why it feels like you're living in reality. But, but the bird becomes Shazam yeah. bird. Yeah. <laughs> and the trees become Shazam trees. You look at a tree and you think, oh, and that is such a staggering, unbelievable thing, a tree. Like Josh. A bird. Why not Josh? <laughs> <laughs> no, but you, but you, you, walk, you walk out in nature and you can see how fundamentally fantastic it is. You get out of the way and all you see is a mystical world. I mean, the whole every, the existence becomes mystical. And this is your regular experience. Yeah, you can walk out. Just walk outside. You can just see the people tree. standing at a bus stop. You are can just see the trees. Wow, that's just so unbelievable. Oh, I was. But remember, Rich and I were having having a meeting at his place. We heard a man by the way outside. We went over to the front door, and there was this spider web. Bottom spider web was a single leaf. Just turn, just turn a little bit of wind. So you've got this four or five foot long spider web, one strand. It's just turning. You think how unbelievably improbable that is, and how difficult it would be to recreate that, and then how fantastically ordinary but yet extraordinary it is. I mean, life just becomes magical. There's just nothing blasé about life. It's just such a fantastically beautiful, alive, vibrant experience. Even the pain. Even the pain. Yeah. Just get out of the way. And Josh too. Sorry. Josh too. Yeah. And, and he, he also. Kind of. He also. <laughs>
<laughs> well, and the reason it becomes miraculous is that you start to see absolutely all of it as one continuous unfolding. The less you feel yourself as separate and you experience yourself as connected in this dance with everything else, as a manifestation of this dance with everything else, the more absolutely everything appears as a kind of beautiful, ecstatic unfolding. Even, you know, a bus tire, you know, coming to a stop. It's part of this one dance unfolding. Absolutely everything is. And then the more you can appreciate even the bus tire, the less you're in a pos position to judge, I like this, I don't like that. I accept this, I don't accept that. Because it's the accepting of this or the rejection of that that builds that sense of separation. It's not supposed to be like this, right? So if you can see the beauty in the supermarket, you can see you know, the beauty at the bus stop, then you're seeing what really is. Well, because of the potency of our social connections, the pointing to me and saying Josh too is almost more potent because you can feel that the people that you're closest to are sometimes where this indicator is the greatest, right? It's not like, you know, oh, I'm doing well because the tree is beautiful, but it's like, oh, I can feel the shift because I wake up next to my wife and it's slightly different that, like, more of the, the the everydayness of it is just particularly more beautiful and more easy it is. And that's the gradient that is most potent, at least for me lately, the most potent one is that like, oh, the baby's crying again and it's beautiful instead of like, ah. I don't accept that. <laughs> no. <laughs> and you can watch relationships change, even long, long relationships, where you have some storyline, some book on some person. I've known this person for a long time and this is all how this person behaves. And you begin to get out of the way of that. And you begin to see them, like you say, the baby. You just see them totally different. You don't have any preconceptions about that person. And you begin to see them in a whole different way. You don't have a backpack on with all the old stories. You come to them with no backpack. Right there in that moment, you're there, they're there, you can see them very clearly, maybe for the first time. And then you give them bandwidth to be something else, and that you are going to put the box around them as being. They become something totally different. So you get out of the way, lots of stuff changes. Then they try to throw the backpack at you. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, You're so, supposed to be wearing the backpack! Yeah, well, so this is, this is, so the surprising thing in the meditation that we just did for me was, um, when we did this, the first door is a skeptic, right? And, you know, the idea of the skeptic is usually associated with science, maybe like, oh, I don't know if I need to believe this stuff, whatever. But what started speaking was what I would have articulated as doubt, which is like, you don't really know how to do this. Like, what do you think you are? Like, and in, 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 in sort of response to, the, like, once you see that, have the transcendental experience, right, which is very potent, it's very defined. For me, and then it was like almost it, it, due to a little bit of feedback, has been the point of refinement, right? For for the last five years, from, and yet the doubt was like, oh, but like, what about your backpack? You don't really know about this, and it's interesting to watch that happen, especially in social relationships, because as you start to feel the narrative release, and it's like very obvious that there's a narrative going on, and then suddenly the narrative releases, and you do whatever it is you need to do. And then, like, and then the response is often like, but you're probably acting out of your backpack, basically, out of these narratives. Like, well, am I? I don't know, am I? So it's interesting, because it's like, is it, would it be accurate at all to say that like just trusting the reference point of the transcendental moment, like is that, is that, is that to be trusted, absolutely? I don't hold experiences. I, mean, I, I just just that's you holding experiences. I mean, to me, it's fundamental to recognize that experiences are compromised. As soon as you choose them, they're no longer valid. So, to me, I, I don't 
pick an experience as being a reference point. Oh, but I mean the feeling. Yeah, not this particular moment that happened to me five years ago, but the particular feeling of the release. It's, it's the gradient difference that it shows, as you were saying. Right, and that's what I mean. It's, that is the that at any moment I can pay attention to whether or not I'm doing this out of some sort of thought structure or, or just notice that it's just sort of emerging. And, yeah, I mean, this is a problem you start to articulate, but when I'm, I don't know, there's a reference point there. Yeah, but, but the, the, only, the only trap is the memory trap we talked about right. this morning. 9-11 <clears throat> trap. I mean, if you try to remember 9-11, you can't pull the feeling back accurately. And so if you, if you, I got trapped for a long time this way. I had a big experience, and it lasted for a long time, and it went away. And I tried to go back and remanufacture that for a long time. I wasted a lot of time trying to do that. And so I finally learned to look, forget about anything in the past, anything, any feeling, any perception, anything at all, because you're not going to be able to back it. So I just dumped it. I think one thing here, uh feeling out, Josh, is whether or not you can <coughs> bullshit yourself. Whether or not what? You can bullshit yourself. Yeah. <laughs> can, can you fool yourself? And I think that that doubt that you're coming to, you know, in my own experience, has to do with really experiencing the fact that there's such a thing as truth and you know it and you know it. And that you can feel the difference of when there's a thought structure there and when there's not. And so in a way, if you have to ask, then there's a thought structure there. <laughs> <laughs> I think something that's been on my mind and like almost oppressively is that I've had moments where I, I feel truth very clearly, but it's almost like trying to grab water once you try and like, mm -hmm analyze it or say I want to hold on to this, it escapes and I attached on to this idea that it's like the ego and that I just need to get rid of the ego and then I'll be able to somehow hold on to that water. And then I was reading through some of the Ramana Maharshi question and answers and somebody asked him, how do you kill the ego? And the response was something to the effect of saying to yourself, how do I kill the ego is like the thief pretending to be the police officer to catch the thief. And that, I just, like that thought has <laughs> been in my head, like oppressively, like, oh my God, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> and it's just, I don't know. But I you see how good that is. That. You felt yeah. that it was wrong. Like yeah. you, you could feel that there was something not quite in alignment there. Yeah. And so you just worked, and this is why we always come back to the verb feeling you have to feel your way. You can feel when there's some thought structure like, you have to kill your ego, and then you will no. be able to hold on to the water. And it's like, uh, no. no, just be with be. the yeah, visiting of the water. Yeah. <laughs> well, the ego's a cunning thing. I mean, there's not just one, two. There's not just one. <laughs> we have this exercise of doing when am I. If you do when am I in the course of the day, you'll see a different person shows up for every relationship. Virginia Woolf said the same thing. You have as many personalities as you have relationships. Every relationship changes who, what shows up. It's an ad hoc entity. There's nothing permanent about that thing. So that's a, a fundamental non-reality. That egoic structure changes. And so just be present for that. The second thing would be Richard Feynman, Nobel Prize winner. One of his favorite quotes was, the first principle is you must not fool yourself. And you're the easiest person to fool. Because it is like it. You've got to be, have your bullshit detector on all the time because you can get yourself trapped so many times. It very, ego is very cunning. It will find all kinds of stories, all kinds of fright wigs, all kinds of imaginary attractions to try to distract you. It doesn't want this to go forward. It doesn't want to lose its job. So it will do all kinds of things to try to derail this. So just be very suspicious of what might be going on. But at the same time, know that you have the capacity to tell the difference. Relatively, yes, you do, Josh, but you've got to be careful with what relative means. I mean, if you say, okay, I can feel attachment to my dog or not attachment to my dog. I can feel the difference between attachment to my dog and not attachment to my dog. 
attachment to my car, and my car isn't I can feel that difference. And so you can pick, you're very good on relative texting. You know, if you get them in contact side by side, you can tell, you know, yes, attachment from no attachment. You can see, feel that. The, di the difficulty is going back and trying to say, I have a stable point back here that I can constantly reference. To me, it's got to be really almost moment to moment present right now so you can get a good relative comparison. Because to go back and try to remember is very difficult. Unlikely to be successful. But so you could go ahead. have it now. Yes, okay. now. Yeah. Get it now. Get them both now. And you can see which is truth, which is truer, and which is less true. Which is interesting because then you can know, I, I was just seeing that I can notice the, the gradient difference between pretending to have to do this on something that happened yesterday. It's like, oh, I didn't realize yesterday that this thing, that I was being egoic at this moment. And that feels entirely different than, yeah. like, right now. It, it, it'll happen even, like, ten minutes ago. I was having a conversation with them, and, oh, I think I was saying that out of ego and not out of, it's like, it just doesn't work anymore. Yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't matter. It's not true. And there's a, let's go to the Sedona method. Not, this is right now. You can't tell. Are there fish in the aquarium right now or not? That's what I mean. You can tell. Are you chattering away about something, or are you being with something? It's a very simple difference. If you get really careful and really still, you can actually watch an emotion start to arise. You can actually feel it in the background of energy, consciousness. You can feel it start to begin to rise. If you pay attention to it, it'll go back down again. You can be very present. You can watch these things begin to run. As soon as you look away, fully manifests. Right in the back of the head. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not complicated. I mean, I think we keep coming coming back to that. It's like, it's like yes, the mind wants to come up with all kinds of stories about what the right way to do this and the wrong way to do this is. But it's like, are you? looking for the source of your thoughts and your emotions? Or are you identifying with your thoughts or your emotions? You can tell the difference. Seems like you can anyway. Good question. Could you talk uh, a bit about what the advantage would be of no thinking as opposed to positive realistic thinking? And is there an advantage of no story versus a nice, entertaining, pleasant story that we realize is a story, but we're entertained by it anyway? I, I haven't found your second choices to be valid. I mean, to me, nothing beats not having any thoughts. So, well, thoughts, don't forget, they're self-referential thoughts, which are the problematic ones. They're problem planning-solving thoughts, which are not problematic. Different brain circuits, this is the default mode network, this is the tasking network. Very different circuitry. Because you get rid of these self-referential problematic narrative thoughts has no impact except positive onto your problem-solving planning. Whole different networks, different functionalities. This can exist completely independently of this. Like your left foot and your right foot. Exactly. And so you don't, you can get rid of these self-referential blah blah thoughts completely. This is virtually always still. My, my blood sugar is very low, low, low blood sugar. If I'm very tired, like the very first thing in the morning, I can have some. But other than that, it's quiet. The other thing, problem planning solving, yeah, absolutely. How do I get to I-95? Different from how am I going to get to 95? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very different kind of a thought. We're going to have to edit that out. And the, and, and, and the break, you should add beeps. You should add beeps. And, and your brain can tell the difference. The brain can parse between this one and this one. It can recognize those, and it can shut these down preferentially. And these can go with alacrity. They can continue. I have now more bandwidth to work in because this is, which is talking almost all the time, is shut up. 